welcome to the chapter 1.5 overview, Developments in Africa. So for the essential question, it's very similar to what we've seen in the past. How and why did states develop in Africa and change over time? So you might remember from the Americas video, if you watched it, that the first part is a causation. So how and why, that is the causes of the development of the states. And the second part, change over time, of course, is continuity and change over time. And as we will see at the end of this video, there are definitely some continuities in this chapter as well as changes. So let's start with relevance. In our interconnected world, culture and economics tie us together more than ever. This chapter is about Africa, and an understanding of patterns of interaction that have emerged over the centuries helps us understand current events. The map on the right shows the mining operations of global corporations in Africa today. And as we will see in this chapter, the lure of precious resources like gold has drawn traders to this part of the world for centuries. For context, first, Let's start with the major regions of Africa. So when we look at Africa and world history, we like to split it up because it's such a large, complex place into regions. So the pink here we're going to use to call, uh, refer to as North Africa. In this yellow part here we have West Africa. Down here in the gray we have East Africa. In the red, Southern Africa. And we will not talk about Central Afri Africa quite as much, but here in this sort of reddish brown color, we would call that Central Africa. The other thing I want to make sure you know is it's not labeled on the map, but the Sahara Desert is roughly this sort of northern, you know, fifth of Africa or so. So if you imagine drawing a line roughly around here, going across, we call the region below that line Sub-Saharan Africa. So sometimes we use Sub-Saharan Africa to refer to all of this stuff down here. Africa has a rather impenetrable geography, and much of the interior of the continent was closed off to outsiders until much later than the time period we're studying here. North and East Africa had direct contact with the Eurasians. As we will see in this chapter, trade networks linked those parts of Africa with states in Asia. Besides the coastal regions of East Africa, most of Sub-Saharan Africa enjoyed the legacy of the Bantu migration, a slow movement of people throughout the continent over many centuries. By about 1,000, most of Africa consisted of small, kin-based societies that used iron tools for subsistence farming. The Bantu originated roughly about here and from maybe two or three hundred CE until 1000 their technology and farming methods slowly m moved through most of sub-Saharan Africa. Let's talk about political structures for starters. The earliest political organization of the interior of Africa was a kin-based system in which an extended family was ruled by a chief, usually the eldest male. These clans made frequent contact with their neighbors, sometimes through peaceful trade and sometimes in war. If you've seen Black Panther, you'll remember the rival clans, and as shown in this scene, trial by combat, which was an occasional method used to select a ruler, especially when clans came into conflict with each other and needed to choose one ruler from multiple clans. These kin-based states persisted in parts of Africa until the 19th century, but the areas directly connected to Europe and Asia by trade often developed more complex political systems, such as the Hausa Kingdom in West Africa. The riches of international trade motivated leaders to develop political and economic systems to fully participate in the trade. This group of seven states lacked a centralized government, but cooperated with neighbors who focused on specialized economic production and connection to Eurasia through the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. So as you can see on the map down here, the Hausa states, remember there's seven of them, are right about here. And the Trans-Saharan Trade Network comes really right across the desert here. There's several paths that these caravans take. And remember that that trade network connecting to the Mediterranean Sea here connects to the rest of the world. But if you remember from your studies about Islam, the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates had spread from the Arabian Peninsula here across North Africa. So this northern part of Africa is under the control of Islamic states, and they are the ones conducting the Trans-Saharan trade down here to West Africa. In later centuries, even more complex kingdoms would develop in this part of West Africa and adopt Islam as the elite religion. As the Trans-Saharan trade network continued to flourish, major empires such as Ghana and Mali developed in West Africa, as you can see on the maps here. For the Muslim traders making the trip across the desert, the big draw was gold, which was plentiful in that part of the world. Caravans of camels brought salt, textiles, and metals and returned with valuable goods like gold and slaves. As in other societies, prisoners of war were sometimes sold into slavery. The ruling class in these empires often converted to Islam, which became the dominant religion of the elite. The first of these empires, Ghana, enjoyed prosperity until its decline around the 11th century. 
it was succeeded by Mali, which was regarded in its heyday as the richest kingdom in the world. We will learn more about Mali in a future chapter. In East Africa, we have two more states that developed, Zimbabwe towards the south and Ethiopia farther north. So here on our map of Africa, the kingdom of Zimbabwe is way down here. It's not shown on the map, but the kingdom of Ethiopia would be roughly in this region next to where it says Red Sea. And you can see here, here's the Red Sea, and we'll talk in a minute about a specific kingdom called Aksum, but this general region over here we're using to refer to as Ethiopia. Due to their location, these states were connected to the world through the Indian Ocean trade network. So again, back to the map, the Indian Ocean trade connects to the coast of East Africa. That is how Zimbabwe accesses it, and then they would go off in this direction, and it also connects to the Red Sea, which is how Ethiopia would access it. Blessed with rich gold deposits, Zimbabwe used revenue from taxing the gold trade to build stone cities and protective walls, some of which still stand today. As you can see on the map, Zimbabwe is not on the coast. Its connection to the Indian Ocean trade relied on the Swahili city-states, and they are located right next to Zimbabwe, up and down the coast here of East Africa. Agriculture and animal grazing provided food, but by the 15th century, overgrazing had made the land sterile and the kingdom declined due to lack of food. Ethiopia, up in the north, is different from the three states we have discussed so far because it was Christian rather than Muslim due to a trade connection with the Roman Empire dating back to the classical era. So you can see here that this general region of Ethiopia is located on the Nile River, which goes up through Egypt here to the Mediterranean. And that part of the world was part of the Roman Empire in the classical era, which era we're talking about, you know, the first, second, third centuries. And so that is how Christianity made its way to Eastern Africa. So modern-day Ethiopia was an island of Christianity, and the kingdom of Aksum encouraged the practice of Christianity, building 11 churches of rock, such as the one shown here. In Aksum, shown here on the map, Christianity was combined with traditional beliefs like ancestor veneration to create a unique form of the religion. You might compare this process with how Christianity developed in Latin America, which you learned about in the previous chapter. Due to its location, Axum was able to connect to Indian Ocean trade as well as trade to the north along the Mediterranean Sea, giving it an especially valuable opportunity. As we move from economic and political themes to social structures, it's important to remember that the vast majority of states in Sub-Saharan Africa were kin-based, which we discussed at the beginning of the chapter. In these societies, social structures were based on practical matters like age and ability, so younger people carried out more physical tasks. In general, men filled skilled roles and women managed the home and engaged in agriculture. Slavery was common, and one could become a slave as a prisoner, criminal, or to pay off a debt. The chart in your book reviews three types of slavery in world history. Please notice that chattel slavery, which is maybe what we're used to from our studies of U.S. history, did not exist in Africa at this time. There was a widespread slave trade between East Africa and the Middle East, as you can see on this map. Common labor for these slaves was on the sugar plantations of Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq. A famous slave uprising occurred between 869 and 893, making it one of the largest slave rebellions in history. Despite the rebellion, the institution of slavery and the trade in slaves persisted into the modern era. And think about that persistence as a possible continuity. In African societies, the arts played important political roles, as well as the cultural ones we are used to. The persistence of ancestor veneration meant rulers needed a way to communicate with their predecessors, and visual and performing arts were a path to this connection. Bronze sculptures, such as the one from Benin shown here, provided a link to ancestors, but the most important role was filled by storytellers known as griots. Performing on instruments like the kora, shown here on the right, griots performed songs that were the keepers of oral history and knowledge of a clan. At this time, sub-Saharan African languages were generally not written down, and griots were crucial in passing on knowledge from one generation to the next, so that their cultural, political, and economic practices could continue. I thought we'd look at a timeline here to put some of this into a time context. So these are the major states on the top row that we've talked about. Hausa, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Mali, and Ethiopia, with a reminder of where in Africa they were located. And then the time range of when they flourished is on the bottom to kind of help you place things in context, because our chapter looked at it regionally. So we talked about, for instance, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe together, but they're quite separated on the timeline. This might be a good review tool for you. Now for our essential question. Remember we started by pointing out it has two parts, a sort of a causation part, as you can see on the top of this slide, how and why did states develop, and then the continuity and change part, 
uh, as the second part of the question. So things to think about for that causation, what would cause states in Africa to develop? The resources that we talked about, like gold, for instance, the connection to the trade networks, especially the Trans-Saharan and the Indian Ocean, the role of religion in connecting African societies to other people and also to supporting the authority of the ruler. And that was primarily Islam, but there was also that Christian example in modern-day Ethiopia. And the cultural practices of griots in helping to create some cohesion in the society. And then for change over time, the social hierarchies and slavery are continuities, as is the importance of that trade connection. And adopting religions or changing religions, like Islam, would be a change. And so would be the various examples and reasons why states decline to begin with. That's your chapter 1.5 overview. Happy studying!